Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Greg and the team here just for inviting me to preach this morning. If you have a Bible, will you please turn in it to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And uh, I'm going to say some things if you've heard me speak at all this week or over the last couple of weeks. I'm going to remind us of a couple of things, but then I want to speak a little bit more specific into the life of this church if I can. I mean, like God has been speaking. I think our danger in a season like we've just been through is that I want to say ignorance in the kingdom is not bliss. We can't be ignorant about the things God's been doing. And I think so often we just hope God's in it and we trust. But this crazy season we've been through, and we have been, it's been a global season, not just you in South Africa, but all of us around the world have been through a crazy, crazy time. And the reminder for us today is that this moment that we've been in has not paused the mission God's had us on. Uh, I don't believe God stopped anything He was doing. If I can say this, maybe God paused what we were doing <laughs> uh, to remind us again of what He is doing and to remind us that actually without Him, we cannot do anything. And so it's kind of, we've always said that and believed that, and then when we're challenged, we had to come back to truly, truly believing that. And I am often, uh, um, as I read Scripture, I realize that shaking reveals what we are actually anchored to. We don't know what we're anchored to till the shaking takes place. And then what's inside is what really comes out when the shaking happens. And what I've realized is in seasons of, uh, of confrontation and seasons of crisis that the destiny of God is revealed way more than in seasons of comfort and convenience. And so while it's been a hectic, hectic season, there's been the, the destiny of God being revealed afresh to all of the followers of Jesus to the church, to the people of God, of what really matters. We kind of think we are on track with what matters. And then again, when crisis hits, we get back to what really matters. I don't know about you, but I, I want to give my life and my whatever lies ahead for me in my years on this earth with my family and the people and the involvement. We want to make sure it really matters rather than, gee, let's carry on and hope God's in it. And so I've said this, in this season, I think God's been reclaiming His church. Now, can I remind you, the church is not this building. How great this is, and I'm grateful for it. The church is us. And God has been reclaiming His church. I, I, I'm convinced as I travel around the world, and now the world is open again, it's not the uh, self-indulgent culture or self-indulgent immorality of the culture of the people out there that hinders the work of God. I'm convinced it's the self-sufficient mentality of God's people that actually hinders what God wants to do through His church. We almost think we can do this without Him. God, we've got this. We don't need you. But actually, we need God. And God's revealed that again, and He's reclaimed His church. And the church is us. So can I ask you this morning, have you been reclaimed by God through this season? Have you come back to, it's all for you. It's all really about you. I believe God's been resetting his church. I really do. And I know that's a scary word, but I think we've been so busy as the church globally doing church that perhaps we forgot to be the church. Thank you. One or two of you amening there. I'm, I'm saying the church, maybe not you guys, but the rest of the churches in the world. Okay. I also think that God's been realigning our hearts and repositioning us where he wants us to be. And so it's a good thing to come back to that place. Where does God want us? What does God want us doing? And keep on moving in that. I also think it's been a great release. God's released us from things in order to release us into greater things. In 2020, in January 2020, I went and landed on the shores of Australia to preach the gospel. And I felt the Lord give me a prophetic word. It's going to be a season of release. So I preached to my Aussie mates. Season of release. 2020 is going to be a season of release. God's going to release things on us and over us. And I kind of thought that means there's the backing of heaven. And we're going to get all that God's given us. And... This is going to be a season. And I flew out of Australia and I landed back in the U.S. And about a week later, the whole world shut down. And so my Australian mates decided they're going to text me and say, Hey, Tara, <coughs> how's about that prophetic word you preached? That there's going to be a season of release. What happened to the release? We all locked up. And I claimed, well, I'm no prophetic. I'm not a prophet. I never claimed to be a prophet. So that's my, right there, my excuse. But just looking back, friends, let's be honest. We have been released in these last couple of years, not how I saw it, but how God has released us from things in order to release us into greater things. God doesn't take for the sake of taking. God releases us, takes from, in order to make us more effective so we can be released into greater things. And so the question I ask again today is, have you been released? Are you released? Are you hanging for what was? 
Are you keep going back to what was? Are you hankering and longing for an era that no longer exists? Or are you walking with God in this moment now and looking forward to what He wants to bring us into, released from in order to be released into greater things that God has for us? And here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, it, it, it's almost like, let's just get back to the Word of God. It's like we've got stories, we've got co- great understandings, great confirmation. But for me, I want to go back to the Word of God and say, okay, what really matters? And I, I, I want to talk a little about, uh, about the favor of God. But let me say this, you cannot earn the favor of God. I'm not saying that by any means. This church, in its history of how many years you've been going, I know some of your journey, a lot of your journey, and I want to tell you, you've wor- walked in the favor of God as a people. It hasn't been easy. Favor doesn't mean easy, but you have walked in the favor of God. And in your favor, in walking in that, we've, we've experienced the favor of God. And so there has been this incredible favor that God has given you as a people. And I hope you're taking it seriously and enjoying it, but also recognizing it's for reasons and purposes to serve the plan of God. And so what I want to share this morning is uh, what is the focus of a, a people that God favors? And it's not to earn the favor, but it's to keep on walking in the things that matter to God. And I think one of the great texts to go back to is the scripture here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And can I say about this church, the Thessalonica church, it was burst, burst, it was birthed in persecution. It was not an easy season when this church was planted. It wasn't things were going well. These people were persecuted. They were in prison. They were, they, they were not allowed to do what we're doing this morning. They were not allowed to gather. There was a whole lot of opposition and threat and coming against, persecution coming against God's people. And it's into that context that Paul plants this church by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it says that this church uh, was established. Paul said this church was established in three Sabbaths. Now, we've been planting churches in our togetherness for 45 years all over the world, and I'm grateful for all the local churches that God's planted and allowed us to be involved in. But I'm going to tell you this. In our 45 years history, I've never met or been in a local church that's been established in three weeks. I've been in a lot of churches that are still 30 years later trying to be established. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm saying maybe we've been busy with the wrong things or busy with stuff people want or culture wants or the church wants rather than the things that matter most to God. And So when you come back to this, it would seem that this church understood some things. And as Paul writes to these people, he reminds them of some of the things. I want to highlight a few this morning of just the things. And I mean, it's not a checklist for us. It's a genuine understanding. These are the things that are important to God. Therefore, these are the things that are important for us today in this room as New Day Church. And it's not the elders' responsibility or our leaders' responsibility. It's every individual in this local church saying, these are the things that matter. Let's give our lives to what matters so we can continue regardless of what comes next. And I wish I could tell you what's next, but I'm being a little more quiet now because 2020... Uh, you know what I said. So, so 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. He says, we always thank God for all of you mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith. Some versions say how you put your faith into practice. See, what I've realized over this crazy season, friends, is that fear rises in the absence of faith. It it does seem that many, and I'm one of those who've been gripped by fear through this crazy season. We've lost. We've lost family members through this crisis. I've lost family members who've passed away from COVID. Uh, We've lost income. We've lost jobs. We've lost people. We, we've lost local church. It's just been an, a crazy, crazy season. And, and, and going forward, it seems that many are living in fear. And I get it. I understand it. But here the thing is, if you don't realize and have faith, then you will continue to allow fear to grip you going forward. And so faith is not a feeling. Faith is not something we hold on to. Faith is wrapped up in a person. Jesus Christ in Hebrews 12 is, the, is our, the author, the perfecter, the pioneer of our faith. It's not a feeling we have. It's someone we go to. It's someone we look to. And Paul writes to this church and he says, your work produced by faith. Note that faith is not just bare belief. 
Faith isn't just believing. Faith is active. It's active. It's, it's doing. It. And he said, your work produced by faith. Faith is more than bare belief. Faith is action. Faith to believe, and we need faith to do. I, I was praying for you guys this morning, and I felt the Lord say, just, it's a season of faith to step in, faith to step out, faith to step through, and faith to step up. Now, I don't know what that means for you, but God's speaking. Don't hold on. Step in, step up, step through, step out into the things that He's called you. It's not a one day. Now faith is what's required of us. And I believe this season God's brought us back. So Paul writes about this church, and he says, your faith produced, or your work produced by faith. Then he goes on and he says, and your labor prompted by love. Some versions say how your love motivates you to serve others. And I'll just say, just step on our toes for a moment. It would seem that the church globally lost a bit of love through this crazy season. We began to highlight all the things we don't like about each other. We disliked on social media. We unfollowed. We refollowed. We rehashed. We retagged. And we actually began to take each other out. And I'm just going to ask us, please, friends, going forward, let's realize the moments we're in and realize the enemy's strategy. Let's reveal the love of God to even those who don't like us. But let's not get in the fight where we take each other out. I, I, I don't know what it's done in your heart, but I've sat globally and just watched and listened. And I've had to get off social media because I've been so disappointed and angry and wanting to post and say, shut up and stop saying it. Forgive me. I'm just, we just got to calm down with our opinions. Is that okay? Me too. I've got some opinions, but I'm not going to share them with you this morning because who cares what I think about anything? And just so you know, that's the same for you too. So... You know, I, I, I don't want to lose this in this, but I've said this, that I think social media has not maybe enabled the lame to walk, but it has absolutely allowed the dumb to speak. And the dumb are speaking, and the dumb are saying things that is actually unhelpful and not revealing true love, the love of God. And so I, I hope we've learned some lessons going forward. Let's not get in the fight, the wrong fight, and take each other out. We're all on the same team here, the whole church globally. And maybe they believe different things to us, but we need each other, friends. Paul writes to this church, and he says, Your work produced by faith and your labor that is prompted by love. We need love. We need God's love. We need to operate in those things. Then it says, And your, faith, uh, your endurance inspired by hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Your endurance inspired by your hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you endure? How do you stay encouraged? Where does your hope come from? Isn't it interesting how Paul says, it's not your, 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 your endurance that's inspired by your hope in me as Paul, the planter of that church, or your leadership, or your people, or each other, or even the calling of God. Do you know in the United States of America, many churches shut down all churches for a season, but 35,000 churches in the United States of America shut down through COVID and will never open again. 35,000, that's a lot of churches. And I think it's more than that, but that was the statistic I heard a couple of years back. And, and friends, I want to tell you, why is that? Well, could it be hope was, uh, endurance was inspired by hope in church, in ministry, in gatherings, in people, in something other than Jesus Christ? And so the challenge for you and I going forward is where does our hope come from? What is it that keeps us motivated, giving us hope here on the planet, hope here on this earth? How do we endure? How do you stay inspired? Well, the priority, number one, is Jesus Christ. Now, we know this, and I know we know this, but we've got to keep hearing this because Paul highlights to the local church, you, you, you want to walk in, the, in, the, in the, um, the favor of God. You're going to have to continue to prioritize Jesus Christ in everything. I have a friend who recently preached uh, at our equipper in, in the U.S., and we had it in Chicago, and he's from uh, New York. He planted a church there. And he got up and he preached this, and he said, Jesus is either fundamental or he's ornamental in our lives. And basically what he's saying, if Jesus is ornamental, then we fit Jesus around us. But if Jesus is fundamental, then we fit around Jesus. Are you listening? Now, I want to say, honestly, it would seem that the majority of the church today is moving Jesus around to tag on and fit into our lives rather than understand He's fundamental. We change to be more like Him. We don't change Him to fit into us. 
And so it's a corporate word this morning with an individual response. Where do you see Jesus? As fundamental in everything, first place in everything, or is he tagged on, added on, brought somewhere in when crisis hits? Because the foundation of the church in this season, I believe, has been revealed like never before. Shaking, as I said, reveals what we're truly built on. And the global church has been, uh, we, 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 we've been exposed, as it were. And I think the foundation has been built on men and people and giftings and even anointings, but maybe not on Jesus Christ. And so I would pray and trust that coming out of this crazy season that we, God's people, have reconnected with our head, Jesus Christ, and that coming out of this season, we're going to do more for Him out of love than we will out of duty and responsibility or religion. You see, many people in your great nation, many people in the city, and I, knew, I know the city, I've grown up here, I know people who used to go to church or who have tried church. But here's the problem. They tried church, but they didn't try Jesus because they didn't find Jesus being represented by His church. We don't want people to try church. We want them to try Jesus because Jesus is the priority of what it is to be a people who are favored by God. I've said this Correct view of Jesus gives us a correct view of everything else. If your view of Jesus is wrong, can I be honest with you? Your view with every other thing is wrong. Our Christology determines our missiology, and our missiology determines our ecclesiology, and our ecclesiology determines our eschatology. And for those of you from America, sorry, I'll just move on. Let me explain what that simply means. Sounds impressive, not very impressive. Here it is. My revelation of Jesus, how I see Christ, determines how I serve Christ in the mission. And how I serve Christ determines the church. A mission determines this church. And the church plays a major role in end times. There are some maybe in this room this morning that this is your moment. End times, you're coming alive. This is it, right? The end is near. Here we go. Vaccine passports and vaccines and anti this. And I'm not getting into the politics. I'm just trying to tell you this. If your view of Jesus is wrong, your view of end times will be wrong. Because Jesus plays a major role in all things. And that's why I don't get caught up in what that is. Come back to the revelation of Jesus Christ. He hasn't been given a place. He's been given first place according to Colossians chapter 1. First place means first in everything, not a place. And your and my kind of cause, and I look around and I see gifted men and women in this room with, with calls from God. No question. The cause you, if I took the microphone, I went around the room and said, tell me what's on your heart. What, you would automatically be passionate about the thing God put in your heart to do here on this planet. It's God-given. It's for you. But here's my, the problem with that. If, if that thing is next to Christ, every time it'll take the place of Christ. It's not Jesus and justice, Jesus and ministry, Jesus and the poor, Jesus and right. It's Jesus, then everything, because your cause has no value if it's not under Christ. And if it's next to Christ, it takes the place of Christ. That's why, my dear friends, we've got to contend for the revelation of Jesus first in all things, everything preeminent. And we've got to keep coming back to the Jesus of the Bible, not the Jesus of our culture or the Jesus of the church or the Jesus of our Sunday school. I'm not having a go at those things. The Jesus of the Bible is what we're about if we're going to truly understand the priority of Jesus in everything. Amen? Amen. Jesus is our head. We keep saying He's the head of the church. And a body without a head is a corpse. And we got our head back in place. Praise God. Now we got power and authority and come back to it. But Jesus is not just the head of this church. He's also the heart of this church. Because many will say, He's the head, we're the heart. No, friend. He's the head of the church. He's the heart of the church. He's the hope of the church and the hope of the world. Paul writes in Colossians 1.27, Christ in us is the hope of glory. We're not the hope of glory. Christ in us. So He's the head of the church. He's the heart of the church. He's the hope of the world and the hope of the church. Are you with me? You know what we are? Hands and feet. Now, I'm just going to explain to some of us that my hands and feet don't tell my head what to do. I think I've got that right. Biology teachers, I learned biology in this country, so if I'm wrong, it's your fault. But watch this. I'm going to move my hand. Who told my hand to move? My head. My head doesn't say, yeah, anyway, I'm getting confused here, but But are you listening, friend? We love to, oh, Jesus, yeah, you first in all. You're the head, we're the heart. No, no, we're the hands and feet. If we're going to better represent Christ, when people not try 
church, they've tried Christ, they've tried, they've found Christ because the church is better representing Jesus. It's going to be because we simply understand we are hands and feet of which He's the head, He's the heart, He's the hope. Let's adjust accordingly going forward because God favors a people that realize truly that Jesus is first in everything. Fundamental or ornamental? It's a big difference. St. Francis, uh, uh, sorry, the prayer of St. Patrick says, May Christ shield me today, Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit, Christ when I stand, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. May that be the testimony of every one of us in this room. New Day's testimony, Christ in everything. We, we have to stay there because we don't default there. Keep on making sure Jesus is first in everything. Verse 4, he says, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He's chosen you. Loved and chosen. I want to say this to you this morning, friends. God loves you. And not because you came to church this morning. Not because you're a believer. Not because you're married. Not because you have money. Not because you carry a position. I... I, I God loves you unconditionally. Now, I, I've got three sons, and they are in South Africa, but they are ministering elsewhere today. But I want to tell you, I love my kids unconditionally, but with conditions. I love them more when they reflect me better. I love them more when they do what I tell them to do. It's just the way it is. So I can stand up and say, I love them unconditionally, but honestly, there are times I love them more because they do stuff I want them to do. And every parent has that say, that's not what God says. God loves you, period, full stop. It doesn't matter what you do, don't do. He cares so much that it matters, but He doesn't love you more because of what you do. And you need to know this if you're going to carry the favor of God. It's not based on you or anything you can do. It's all based on Him loving you, full stop, period. And it's so hard to tell the world out there about the love of God if you don't have the love for yourself. You can't give what you haven't got. And so a church that understands the favor of God, Paul says, loved and chosen. Not chosen, then loved. Loved and chosen. Big deal, friend. You might sit here this morning and say, what am I doing here? I don't know, but what am I doing here? I don't know, but God loves you. It doesn't matter what you're doing here. It's who loves you. And I, I believe if Jesus, if I was the only person on this planet, I believe Jesus would have come just for me. You say arrogance. No, that's called love. Jesus came for the, the multitudes, but He also came for the individuals. And I want to say to you this morning, friend, regardless of who your father, mother is, if you know who your parents are, if you don't know, if you've been told all your life, you're, whatever you are, I'm telling you this morning that if you were the only person on this planet, my Bible tells me Jesus would have come just for you. That's how valuable. It's not about what you do. It's who you are. And and I, I, want, I want to say in persecution and in hardship and whatever coming next for the church, we better know we're loved unconditionally. Loved. We don't minister for that position. We minister from that position. It's easier to give that love to people when you understand it for yourself. Don't you dare tell them about the love of God if you haven't understood the love of God for yourself. Church, you need to know you're loved and chosen. Are you there? If that doesn't get an amen, geez, I don't think I'm going to get an amen today. That's the good, best news. That's the goodest, goodest news. I can say that because in South Africa we make up words, so I love it. But I want you to, please, please don't miss that. Why did Paul write in there? Loved and chosen. Because they had to understand they were loved by God and chosen by Him. Now we used to sing that song, I Found Jesus. And I love that song, but it's theologically wrong. I found Jesus. Well, let me remind you, Jesus was never lost. Just the point is, He found me, which is even more amazing about grace. So not only does He find us, not only does He choose us, but He loves us, He found us, chose us, handpicked from heaven for such a time as this, through this crazy 20, 20, 21, 22, crazy season. Why are we here? Handpicked from heaven for such a time as this. You're not going to read books on how to get through this, although people are writing books. Don't read the books. Look to heaven, look to word, the Word of God, and let God take you through the season. But I don't understand it. Uh, it's been crazy. But in it all, hand-picked, chosen by God, 
Even if I would not choose myself, He chose me. Friends, we need that revelation day in and day out. And it comes when you understand who Christ is, then you understand who you are. You there? Let's read on. Verse 5, he says, Because our gospel came to you, not simply with words. Some versions say, not merely in the form of words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. And so the third thing, so the first one is a priority is Christ. Second thing is our position, loved and chosen. Thirdly, I want to say our pa- the power we've been given. Now, I realize that there's some who are for and some are against. Some are like, give me the power stuff. Others are, I'm nervous of the power thing and just keep it over there. You know the worst thing we could do with power? Pretend we don't have it. And I think there are churches and believers who've just put aside power stuff because we're just not comfortable. And I understand it, friend, but you can't pretend you haven't got something that God's given you. And here's what I want to say. Here's what I want to say. I've got statistics that are very troubling. What I've realized is the greatest threat to the Word of God is not those who directly oppose it. It's those who claim to believe it, but who are ignorant to what it really says. When it comes to spirit things, I think the church is very ignorant. We're either so weird about it or we're so anti because we haven't understood the Word of God. The United States of America, and I know that's not you, but it's just uh, a good statistic. Recently, in September 2021, so that was last year, uh, a, a study of... 2,000 adults, U.S., it says, while a majority of American self-identified Christians believe that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and is the creator of the universe, more than half reject the existence of the Holy Spirit. Are you hearing that? God's all-powerful, all-knowing. He's uh, creator of everything, yet more than half say, but the Holy Spirit does not exist. I'm going to tell you, we have a problem if we believe that. And why we have a problem is because we've too long presented the Holy Spirit as a blessing from God. Now, if He's a blessing from God, can I just say, then we get to choose whether we want that blessing or not. Right? I'm not sure I want that blessing. Give me other blessing. Well, I'm going to just tell you the Bible doesn't say He's a blessing from God. This is what the Bible tells us. He is God. Now we're in trouble because what will you do with God, the Holy Spirit, not the blessing from God? So I think we need a fresh understanding from Scripture of the Trinity. We need to preach the truth. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They all play major roles. They're equal. They all know their role. Friend, I know it's confusing. Some have said, well, if you, if you try to explain the Trinity, you lose your mind. But if you don't explain the Trinity, you lose your soul. I'd rather lose my mind than my soul. So I'm trying to work it all out. But this I know. It's not... Three gods. It's one God, three persons. The best I can explain it is I'm a, I'm a son, I'm a father, and I'm a husband. Same person, different roles. And I want to just say, when you reject God the Holy Spirit, you're rejecting God Himself. Therefore, we've got to come back to say, you can trust God the Holy Spirit. You might not trust the people around you or the weird people are throwing and pushing you over and doing all the weird stuff, but you best be know you can trust God the Holy Spirit because He is essential. He exists. Without Him, we can't function in what God intended for us. And so Paul writes, he said, we didn't just come with word, but word is essential. We're not word or spirit. we word and spirit. We've got to stop the divide. And if you were about the one, you best get about the other because we need both. Two wings on an airplane are required to fly. We need word and spirit working together. There's no divide in Scripture, but there's a great divide in the church. And I want to tell you, God is in a moment and a season of releasing fresh revelation of word and spirit. And we've got to con- the, bring these together and trust the Holy Spirit as God. 2 Corinthians 3.17, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Very quoted Scripture. What that people think is, well, wherever the Spirit is, there's freedom. Well, this room is full of people, and the Spirit of God is right here, right now. I believe that biblically, yet not everyone in this room is free. Well, it's not where the Spirit is. It's when you're yielded to the Spirit as Lord, that's where you find freedom. Philip Yancey said, a society that denies the supernatural usually ends up elevating the natural to supernatural status. When we don't believe or we deny supernatural, we take natural and put it at a supernatural status. And while that's in the world, it's also in the church. 
And we've seen the church fall apart and people and leaders falling out of the race. And my heart is broken. But it's, the church people are losing their way because we've taken natural people and put them at net supernatural status because we've rejected the supernatural. Are you with me, friends? While you need gifts and leaders, we need to have our faith in the supernatural and understand God is a God who wants to demonstrate His power again. Zechariah 4, 6, it's not by might, it's not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. seems that much of the church today is dominated by the Spirit of this age rather than the Spirit of Christ. Are you there? We need to activate, we, can I say this? We don't need to activate the Holy Spirit. Please hear this. I listen to God say, oh, we need to activate Him. No, no, again, we don't need God to be activated by us. He said, are we going to activate the Holy Spirit? No, we're not. He's already activated. We don't need to invite Him. Why? He's already here. You know what we need to do? Honor Him. That's what we need to do is honor Him. We need to honor Him. Some say, well, I, I desire the Spirit, but I, I don't know about the unusual. It's kind of like saying, I want to swim, but I don't want to get wet. There's something unusual about what God wants to do when the Spirit of God is doing something. I'm just going to challenge you again this morning. It's not for some of us. It's for all of us. And not just those up on the stage who get to walk in signs and wonders. It's God's called His people to reflect Him wherever they go. And God wants Word and Spirit operating in His church. Let's build according so we can carry the favor of God where He's called us to go. Verse 6 says, You became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering you welcome the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. So you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Not the model, a model. You know, in my country, it's all about Christian president. We need a Christian president. We need Christian government. We need Christian politicians. We need Christian business people. We need Christian books, Christian teachers, Christian schools, Christian songs, Christian book. Uh, everything we need is Christian. And I want to say that's true, but more important than all that, we need Christian Christians. Easier to say Christian government, Christian. No, no, just go be a Christian. That's what we need. God's people to simply live out Christianity here on earth. So Christian Christians, a pattern that people around the city and around the nations can look at New Day and not just look at Scripture and go, gee, I wish we could be like that. They could look at you and say, that's what it means to be a New Testament, a follower of Christ, a people linked together of all diversity, all cultures, coming together to serve God's people. It can be done. And while we should look at Scripture, we should also see it outplayed here in this local church. Paul says, you became a model, a pattern that people could see it, say, that's what it means to be a believer. Are you a Christian Christian this morning? Because if you're not, come back to serving Christ and being a follower of Christ. And the best way, my friends, to identify that you are a follower of Christ, you ready? Follow Christ. Be it. Let's not just talk about it. And then we see here in verse 8, I'm landing, I've got a few minutes left. It says, the Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. I believe proclamation, that God looks for a people and favors a people who will proclaim His name, proclaim Him, preach Him. See, the, the Lord's message rang out. Can I, can I remind you, what happens here does not stay here. God never intended it. Can I say even this COVID thing, I don't believe God sent it, but He certainly allowed it. And I know He allowed it because it happened. What I've realized is that it wasn't to get the church online. It was to get the church out of the building. Get out and get this gospel to people. Because it's great to hear the gospel preached here, but most of us are believers. What about out there? The gospel rang out. Rang out. God favors the people where the gospel's ringing out. It's going with us where we go. Someone said, if your gospel isn't touching others, it's never really touched you. Charles Spurgeon says, the whole business of the whole church, to get the whole gospel to the whole world. And those of us who love to take what Francis, Francis of Assisi said, you know, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. Now, I love what he was saying, and I know why he was saying it, because the church was misrepresenting the gospel they were preaching. But biblically, we're not called to just live it. We're actually called to declare it. We must preach the gospel, not just live it. Declare. We are heralds. I mean, people need good news. How many of you know America, the world is in a, 
a mess. And in South Africa, they don't need another good person doing a good thing. They need the good news to be preached and declared. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom needs to be declared and demonstrated. It's kind of like saying, hey, let's go feed the hungry this afternoon. And if necessary, let's give them some food. How many of you know they need food? These people, the world needs the good news, the gospel to be declared and demonstrated. So don't just, oh, I'm going to live it out and hope one day they ask me. They don't need to ask you right now. They need to hear us declaring the revelation of Jesus Christ. This message was sung out, rung out from these people. Such a challenge we're seeing right now because the, the gospel is kind of been sidelined because we've got into the fight of times and end times and and those are important things. So you know when Jesus was questioned by his disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, they said, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And they said, it's not for you to know times or seasons that my father said by his own authority. None of your business, he was saying. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes and you'll be witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the Adamas past year. So they were getting caught up in times and nationalism and politics and religion. And they're putting it all together. And the Lord said, none of that's your business. Focus on a mission, is what he told them. Matthew 24, Jesus said, All these things will begin to happen as the end draws near. The beginning of the end, the start of the end. And he says in Matthew 14, uh, 24, verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Are you listening? Again, don't get caught up in times and seasons. Focus on the clear mission. Every time God brings us back, Jesus brings us back to mission. But we've made the moment the mission rather than cracking on with the mission. I want to just challenge us. Focus on the mission. This is our season of mission, not a season to hold on and hope people attend our churches again and people will come back. Just crack on with the mission of God. God honors and favors the people where the message rings out from the places to the people around us. Are you there? Uh, someone, uh, Hilton Rose, I'm sure some of you know him, he's on our translocal team. He texted me this morning knowing I was preaching here. don't know how he knows, but he, maybe he's prof prophetic. But he texted me about 5 o'clock this morning. He said, whilst praying, I got a picture of a large swarm of bees, and they were very determined, and their flying formation was super tight and aligned. I see it's representing New Day Church. He said, I sense God wanting to remind them that it's through their collectiveness that the mission is strategically achieved. So the beautiful thing about a bee is that its entire life is lived for the sake of collecting and contributing for the benefit of others. They are sacrificial servants. So the Lord is saying, this is to you, you who have been last will now be first in this season. He said, you've learned to stay with me, stay the course, stay together and wait for my plan. Now prepare to receive a reward for those who wait. Keep all attention and activities focused on the one mission. Somebody in another church texted me to tell you that message this morning while praying for me to preach here. Let's read on. We land with this point. Paul writes, Therefore we do not need to say anything about it. Verse 9. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Perspective. Perspective. Living for eternity. See, God favors the people who are captivated with eternity. See, these people believed that Jesus was coming back in their lifetime. The early church believed. Paul believed. He wrote, the end is near. Hold on. And, like, and, and it wasn't near. But we are 2,000 years closer to the end. I always say that I believe Jesus is coming back in my lifetime. If I'm wrong, it doesn't matter. I can't show you that biblically, uh, theologically when he's coming back because no one knows. Even Jesus doesn't. So if you know, shh, keep it to yourself. You're confusing us. I'm not mocking. I'm just saying, come on, just crack, crack on with the mission. Stop worrying about what you can't. Anyway. These guys believe Jesus is coming back. This early church, God favors the people who catch perspective of eternity. They waited for the return of Christ. And I think COVID, this season, has forced us to come back to the value of life. People have passed. People are dying. It's like we've always been dying, but it's like it's suddenly, but I'm watching. Nothing's normal, but people coming back to normality and forgetting about eternity and cracking on with their own lives here on earth. Friends, it's a dangerous thing. Surely we don't need another 
pandemic or plague or whatever to remind us of eternity. Things that we do here on earth have eternal ramifications. This life is a dressing room, a, a dress rehearsal for the next. Don't make this life the life. Function in the things of God in this life that will have ramifications and you'll have eternal reward for what He's called you to do here on earth. Don't get caught up in the nonsense here on this planet, local churches. Please, new day. It's a new day. And we've got to focus on the bigness. C.S. Lewis said this, If we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. We were made for another world. I think for too long, we've asked this question, and it's an essential question. But We've said this, if you were to die tonight, where would you spend eternity? And, that, and that's a, friend, that is a great question needed to be answered. And if you don't know Jesus this morning, then I want to tell you, your eternity is in a, you need, you need to settle this thing this morning. Jesus Christ did it all so you can have eternal life with Him. Or eternal means forever. So you, you better answer that question. But I, I want to just challenge the rest of us who are believers this morning. Not just if you die tonight, where will you spend eternity? If you want to catch understanding of eternity, if you wake up tomorrow, who and what will you live for? Think about that. Who and what will you live for? That's the people who are gripped by eternity. Rather than just getting on and hoping God's in it, we want to live for Him in His will, in His plan, knowing that Jesus can come back or we can go be with Him anytime soon. And I, I just trust that that grips our hearts because then we will serve God's purpose in all seasons. And you have done well, but my friends, God favors a people that take these truths and live them out, not to earn it, to stay in the favor. And I believe this is a favored church. You're a favored people. But make sure, make sure you focus on the right things and not getting busy with all this other stuff. Can we close our eyes? Thank you so much for being a part of our meeting today. Um, can I just ask two things? The first is, if today the, the message has in any way been useful to you, would you mind just maybe liking it or putting uh, perhaps a statement down or a comment down that we can know how the ministry has helped you? Maybe a thumbs up maybe you can subscribe to the channel do whatever just so we can know what impact this message may be having on you and secondly you may be someone who's saying greg i hear you and this 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 hope that jesus has for us can come into my heart and it can change me but the reality is that i don't even know if i know jesus i want to say two things to you right away the first is he's near you right now the Bible says if you believe in your heart that He is the Lord and if you confess Him with your mouth, you will be saved. Which means you just need to, where you are, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, even now. And just say, Lord, here I am. I recognize who you are. I confess my sin to you. I acknowledge you as Jesus Christ, the Lord of all, the Son of the living God. And I want to follow you. I want to become a disciple of yours. I want to, I want to give my life to you, Lord. And you can pray that prayer right now between you and the Lord. Secondly, you can get hold of us um, you can see the telephone number. You can get hold of us and say, hey, I've given my life to the Lord. Can you help me from here on out? And we could either send you some material. We can uh, put you in touch with a really good church near you. Uh, if you live in our area, you can come to us. You can follow us on YouTube. But it is good to get connected into the family of God, to get connected into a local church, that your life changes being surrounded with the family of God. Please stay in touch. God bless you.